Rolling, 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 raw, rolling, rolling, rawhide, rolling. The Katy Perry concert was exacerbating at best. The Google Flugelhorn is at the Guggenheim. The Google Flugelhorn is at the Guggenheim. John F wants to know, what's your favorite IR brand and specific cab by that brand that you like to use when recording guitar and bass? So, that's an easy answer for me. Uh, on every review and demo that you've heard from me just about, um, I've been using Rosen Digital IRs of various kinds. Um, now, here's the interesting thing, not that interesting. So when I'm monitoring my sound, uh, the cab that I use is 95% uh, of the time the Carvin Legacy cab uh, that they actually IR'd off of a cab um, that belongs to a friend of mine. and. For some reason, it just hits me the right way. It's got everything that I like in a cab. Now, when I send the tracks to Alex to mix, uh, the cab that he uses, he, well, he doesn't always tell me which cab he uses. Um, sometimes he'll send it back to me and I'm like, what cab is this that you're using? I don't really like it. And sometimes I'm, I'll tell him specifically to use the Legacy uh, because I like it a lot. Now, if there's three versions of the Legacy. Now, when, if you buy the IR pack, you get uh, three different, it's basically three different mic positions. You know, one of them is like dead on the, um, right on the cone and, or on the, on the cap and then slightly, you know. Uh, and the one that's right on is number one and that one's really bright. Sometimes if the tone is too bright, I'll use two or sometimes even three. Uh, also, it depends uh, a little bit on whether I'm doing rhythm guitars or lead guitars. Generally, for my purposes, um, I think that a nice bright cab for rhythm guitar is very important. And I like, for lead guitar, I like something a little bit smoother. And so uh, either the number two or the number three cab is what I like to hear. So the cab that we use could vary wildly because of the mix. Uh, it depends on a great number of factors and my preferences might not always take priority. So. I don't know, there's um, a bunch of other ones from Rosen Digital that we use sometimes. The ones that I like the best, aside from the Legacy, are the um, Rosen Atlantic Custom. I like that one a lot. And the Marshall 1960A is another one that we've been using a lot. So um, I'm actually going to be doing a review, I know I said this before, but I'm going to be doing a review pretty soon of the Rosen Cab IR Loader, uh, which is going to be out uh, reasonably soon, I think. So hopefully I'll get to that really soon. Rob right now, Rob Rosen is watching this going, yeah, Trey, when, when, are, you, when are you going to do that, bro? And the answer is soon. Soon. For bass, I don't ever use a cab. Uh, I go direct. Um, I use the Dark Glass B7K Ultra all the time, 90% um, of the time. Uh, sometimes I use like Easy Mix, but Generally, you don't really need a cab for bass. It's just something about it. I don't really know what it is. You just, the best bass tones are generally direct. It's pretty rare that you'll hear a recorded bass tone, especially in metal, that has a cab sound on it. Um, I've seen a lot of producers do it, uh, big time producers, big metal producers, and you know, you, whatever sounds good is what sounds good. You know, if you stick a mic on there and you get the sound that you want, fuck yeah. Usually it's a combination of direct line in and a cab sound if they're using a cab. Don't feel like you need to put a cab IR on a bass sound uh, just because it's, you think it's a thing that needs to be done. It's, uh, it's not very important and it might just make your bass sound too dull. Now with guitar, you have to have a cab otherwise, unless you're going for that, uh, you know, Beatles revolution sound and that shit is terrible. They were trying to be revolutionary and it worked. And I can't listen to that song because it sounds like shit. Actually, the way that they got that sound, funny enough, is plugging the guitar direct into the board and fucking cranking up the preamp and just distorting the shit out of it. So uh, if you want a shitty tone, that's how you do it. It sounds like the sound of like if bees and mosquitoes like formed an alliance and they, and they attacked you simultaneously right on the eardrum. like. Like, the mos like a bunch of mosquitoes riding on a bee and the stinger goes into your eardrum as the mosquitoes are <laughs> Yeah, that's what, that's what that sound sounds like to me. I don't like it. And I fucking love the Beatles, by the way. Love the Beatles. 
huge Beatles fan, massive influence on me. I honestly think they did pretty much everything long before everybody else. Alberto Rodriguez wants to know, do you play any other instruments? Yes, I do. Well, of course, uh, a bit of bass. And I sing. Um, you probably haven't heard me sing all that much. A little bit here and there in some of my reviews. Mostly doing goofy crap. But I have taken voice lessons for quite a, quite a while, and I hope to be doing it a lot more. I love singing. I think it's really fun. And even if I'll never be Dio, you know, uh, it helps to always be growing as a singer for me. And I think that even if you're never going to be a great singer, that you should sing a lot, and it really helps you to connect to the music that you're playing, to be able to sing a lot of the stuff that you're doing, especially to be able to sing the stuff that you're improvising at the same time. This is really important and a great way to get better at improvising because what it does is it connects your musical brain with your fingers because uh, especially guitar players suffer from this syndrome. Uh, when you're improvising, you just kind of fall into these shapes and these familiar patterns and, and that's when it starts to get wanky because you're not making musical sense because you've sort of disconnected your musical brain from the, uh, from the output. So singing helps you to reconnect that. So you s sing whatever it is that you're playing and after a while you're going to start going like, w well, which is coming first, the singing or the playing? Like, they become one. It's really cool. I highly recommend you try it. I also play a little bit of drums, which I think is actually more crucial than singing, even though I just went on a rant about how important it is to sing. Rhythm and understanding how drum parts work and reinforce the song uh, is absolutely crucial if you plan on writing. Uh, you don't have to be good at the drums. I am not a good drummer. I've played like decent rock drums and like real half-ass metal drums for a long time and if I, you know, if uh, I could probably sit in for your classic rock cover band at the drop of a hat, but I can't play blast beats to save my life. But when it comes to composing parts, writing stuff, and especially programming drums, if it wasn't for like the little bit of experience that I've got, it'd sound like shit. So I see people programming drum parts uh, who are guitar players and it just doesn't sound good because they don't know how drums work. So uh, if you can get behind a drum set as often as possible and just suck, even if you suck so bad, it doesn't matter. People are very critical, you know? You try to do something, try something out, oh, how's this work? And they're like, oh man, you suck. Get up, let Steve do it. Steve's a great drummer, man. Um, don't be a dick, Steve. Let, you know, the other guy give it a go. Fucking Steve. <sighs> Play a little bit of keyboards, also very helpful in composing. Um, once again, not that great at it, but did take a lot of lessons, so I should be good at it. I took enough lessons that I should be amazing, but it's just like anything else. Lessons are no good unless you practice, and for some reason I didn't want to practice the keyboard, so anyway. What 412 cabs would you recommend to play some heavy shit? I currently play through a Randall Satan head. Well, anything that you plug a Randall Satan head into is going to sound heavy because that's an awesome amp. Ola is a man of exquisite taste and his design, or him and Mike Fortin's design, um, is uh, everything, you know, it's a great sound for metal. Absolutely crushing. I'm of the opinion that uh, 4x12s fucking suck. They sound good, but uh, after hauling one around Europe for a month on tour, uh, I was like, fuck 4x12s forever. So you uh, probably won't see me with a 4x12 of my own anytime soon. Sometimes they come in and out, you know, I use them for a lot of stuff, but um, in a band context, honestly, like a 2x12 will get you just as far. That being said, there's so many good ones. It's Oh, it's really hard to pin it down. I mean, the old standbys, Orange, Mesa Boogie. Mesa Boogie rectifier, oversized cabs are fucking great. Um, the, uh, you know, the Rev 4x12 that we had in here was fucking phenomenal for a while. Um, I, I would very much like to have another one of those. I loved, oh, the um, PRS cab that we, that we have that we use sometimes, the 412. That one was really well made, sounded really great, sounded very consistent. Something I thought was really phenomenal about the Rev cabs is that 
as an overall sound, it's extraordinarily balanced because they've got two different kinds of complementary speakers going in this like X pattern. So there's two like this and two like this, you know. Um, so now when you mic that up, of course you have to choose one speaker if you're just using one microphone. But when you're standing in front of it, it's like, it just whew, so just rounds out the whole sound. You get a very full sound from top to bottom. Different speakers, even if they're the same model and brand, can be different in, this, in the same cabinet. It's crazy, like, you're like, I got four vintage 30s, why is one of them way better than the rest? I don't really know. It's just a manufacturing tolerances thing, really. Um, but for some reason in this PRS cab that we have, the um, I forget exactly, I think it's called the Stealth Cab. Um, it was just like, they were all almost identical. So, you know, as long as you're not buying some homemade piece of shit from a guy on Craigslist, it's pretty hard to go wrong. And you can get some really good 4x12s used cheap, um, also off of Craigslist. Craigslist is a crapshoot. We all know that. Another collab with Kyle Karich, need more big floppy hats. I would not say no to that, but Kyle lives in Florida and I live in California. So we might have to wait for next year's cruise to make the sequel. Anthony Haga wants to know, are all of you guys John Petrucci fans? Well, I can't speak for Max, but me and Alex are big Dream Theater fans. Uh, probably me in particular. Obviously, uh, I have one of his signature guitars which isn't just because I'm like a Petrucci fanboy or something. It's just the most comfortable electric guitar I've ever played in my life. That fucking bowl contour, bro. Holy crap. Just like your arm just like slides into it and oh, it's flawless. Okay, every guitar needs to have that. I hope they haven't patented it, patented it, it or something because uh, if I ever have a signature guitar someday, I am stealing the shit out of that, so. Watch your back, Petrooch. I'm just kidding, I love that man. I think he's just got really great taste. So much of his stuff is exactly the same way that I like it. So I don't know. And of course I dressed up like him and pretended to be him for a video. So I think it's pretty obvious. He's definitely one of the most influential guitarists for me. I've probably only learned like a handful of Dream Theater songs, four or five maximum in my life, but the first time that I heard John Petrucci play and heard a Dream Theater song, that was when I went, oh shit, I need to practice. And it's really determined the path of my whole life. Uh, so I went to music school, I pursued music as a career, and I went to Berkeley College of Music for a year, uh, and. All of this was basically because I wanted to get as good as him. And of course I never have, but I would be in a very, very different place if it weren't for John Petrucci. So thanks dude. A means to an end wants to know. I have a question man. I have a question man. What's the best site or service to get our EP out there across all platforms, i.e. iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, and also getting it produced physically as in sealed jewel case and all. This is a long question, I have to take a break. <sighs> okay. We just got the mixed and mastered tracks back and the album art, and we've been exploring all the options. I was wondering if you had any suggestions. Thanks for the help, bro -tha. I have an answer man. Maybe I am the answer man. I've used uh, CD Baby, which of course you can't get physical copies from them, but they're a great in independent distribution service that I've used before with no problem, pretty cheap to get it all across every digital media, pretty much platform that exists. So I haven't, it's been a, a couple years since I did that. Hopefully they're still as good as they were then. Now, if you use something like Disc Makers, uh, they have a similar service, I think. Now, here's my biggest piece of advice for you. And this is very important, okay? Take it from someone who has 600 copies of an album sitting in boxes in a garage. Do not get a thousand copies, okay? It seems like a great deal because if you get 500 copies or 300 copies, it basically costs the same as a thousand. But that's only if you get them replicated instead of duplicated. Here's the thing. 
you'll never sell a thousand copies, okay? If I haven't heard of you before, there's zero fucking chance that you are selling a thousand copies of your album. If you were going to sell a thousand copies of your album, you would not be asking me this question, okay? So you need to get the, I can't remember if it's replicated or duplicated, whichever one is the CDRs, okay? Just, just do that, make a, make a hundred or 200, okay? If you clear those out, if you sell 200 copies of the CDR ones, then, and you desperately need a thousand, then you've got it funded basically at that point. And it doesn't fucking matter, okay? Nobody turns a thing over and goes, oh my God, this one's blue. Uh, I don't wanna listen to this band anymore. Nobody fucking cares, 100%, dude. Absolutely not. Don't get a thousand, don't do it. If you don't play a lot of shows, don't even bother getting physical copies made, okay? Um, if you're gonna keep the number way down, 100, 200 maximum, okay? If you play a lot of shows and you think you're gonna be able to clear out that many, then uh, I wish you the best of luck. I will also tell you the best strategy for selling CDs at shows, okay? This I know from hands-on experience. So most bands will go and play their set, they get their shit off the stage, and then they go and they sit at the merch booth and they wait for people to come to them, okay? Here's what you need to do. And this is how my band sold a thousand copies of our album in a month. What you do is you make friends with every single person who came to the show, okay? Unless you're playing a thousand cap rooms, which I doubt you are, this is actually an easy task, okay? When you're done with your set, you get your shit off the stage, grab a handful of CDs, and you go and you make friends with every single person who's there. They didn't come to see you, maybe. Maybe you're the opening band. It doesn't matter. Ask them what they thought of the show, say hello, tell them that you're selling CDs and that they're only X dollars. And if they don't buy them, don't worry about it. Just say, that's all right, thank you for coming. And find out what their names are, make friends. It works a lot more than you think it would. So try it, I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Echno Sheep wants to know, have you noticed a variety in tone that different pick characteristics produce? Well, um, sort of building on our Tonewood conversation from last week, and I applaud you for uh, you all for uh, not unleashing a shitstorm in the comments. Like I prophesied, picks actually do make a pretty noticeable difference. And I've got a video coming out in which I use a bunch of different kinds of picks. And I think it's pretty definitive that you can hear and, uh, and most importantly feel the difference when you're playing with a different kind of pick. Yes, absolutely. A thinner pick will give you much less defined attack. Different materials make a huge difference, not just in the tone, which is very important, but a big difference in the way that you play, which in turn affects your tone a great deal because as everybody knows, tone's in the hands, bro. Tone is in the hands. So look for that video. It's gonna be out real soon, and uh, that will probably answer your question better than me sitting here and jabber jawing about it. Banana Man for the win wants to know, do you like ice cream? Well, doesn't everybody? No, that's not true. Some people do not like ice cream. I actually, I love ice cream in a certain format. So I actually think that the best part is like when you've got the ice cream and the cone together and a bite of that. Ice cream by itself is like, I, I won't get like a bowl and just eat ice cream, generally. You know, when I'm feeling a little wild or whatever. I love a milkshake, uh, which kind of makes me a hypocrite because it's literally the same thing as ice cream. It's just drinkable form. I don't know. I'm from Massachusetts and in Massachusetts, a milkshake is called a frap, not a frappe. It looks like frappe, but it's pronounced frap. So if you are in Massachusetts and you ask for a milkshake, you will get something uh, that you are probably not gonna be happy with. You wanna ask for a frap, okay? Fucking Bostonians know what's up. They know what I'm talking about, right, kid? Yeah. Beyontic, I wonder if you're in relation to Beyonce, wants to know why are there a lack of podcast episodes? That is a legitimate question. Uh, so the podcast basically is something that I made because uh, press people want to do some of these things called phoners, which is when you interview somebody over the phone. And we don't have somebody who can transcribe these interviews. So I was like, oh, if you call it a podcast, then uh, I can just upload the audio and people will listen to it, which I think has um, actually worked out really well. It's an easy way to um, 
you know, take these interviews and just turn them into a podcast. So I haven't really been doing uh, many of these phoners recently. You know, it just comes and goes. Like sometimes they want you to do them, sometimes they'd rather not, sometimes they'd rather do a written interview, whatever. So uh, I just did one uh, two days ago. So we're going to have a new one up also uh, this week. It might already be up today. I don't know. It's with uh, James Monteith of Tesseract, and he was really great. We had talked a lot about some uh, lots of cool stuff that the band is doing and a bit about their tour. So if you're subscribed, you might already have it, or you'll be getting it like tomorrow. So there you have it. John four days ago asks, first off, I would like to say I really enjoy the work your gods does. What do you want, a fucking cookie? Kiss ass. Just kidding. Second, how should I start acquiring recording equipment? Well, no, I'm gonna stop you right there, bro. You need to purchase it with the currency of the country that uh, you are currently in. Uh, that's the best way to acquire things, all right? You have to buy it, otherwise you're gonna get arrested. I feel as though that's a caveat I have to start off with. Um, just looking to get something going so I can record at home and do the one-man band thing. Thank you. Uh, I presume what you mean is what kind of stuff that you should get in order to make that happen. So, easy answer right off, you need an interface, okay? Um, people think they need like a whole bunch of stuff to, to record on your computer. Uh, if you're a guitar player um, and you record guitar and or vocals, you probably don't need something that needs, that has more than two inputs. I used a um, Mbox 2 for the longest time and it only had uh, two preamps and it didn't even have a, like a DI input. I had to get a DI box and go into one of the preamps with that. And you know, and it works great. It's, it's very hard to blow it. You know, there's so many cheap, decent interfaces out there that are just like two channels for a couple hundred bucks. And you don't really need more than that. You need something to be able to supply the sound to your monitors. So you need something with monitor outs, which is all of them, even the smallest, cheapest one that I've had. You need something to be able to plug in your headphones and something to plug your guitar into directly. That's one important thing that I would look out for if you're a guitar player or a bass player. Make sure that it has a specific guitar DI input because you don't want to have to buy a separate DI box. That's another hundred plus dollars that you don't have to spend if you get the right interface. And most of them come with them today. So it would be hard to get one that doesn't have it, I think. So just take a look. Look around, you'll find something. I can tell you the one that I like a great deal. It's a little ex on the expensive side. The Universal Audio Apollo Solo. Uh, I've used that a lot. I did a review about it and stuff. It's got everything that you could possibly need before you're going to upgrade to like an eight channel, you know, rack mount thing. And it's really solidly built and it's fucking, yeah, it's great. They're not paying me to say that. If you're gonna be recording yourself singing and or playing like acoustic guitar or some kind of an acoustic instrument, you're gonna wanna get some kind of a large diaphragm condenser mic. If you're recording at home, you probably don't want something that's a fixed omnidirectional mic. That's where it picks up on, on both sides all around. You want something that's got like a one-sided polar pattern or something that you can change. For home recording, the SM7B from Shure is a great bet, especially if you're gonna be screaming a lot or if you sing with a very powerful voice. Uh, you can sing point blank right into it. It comes with a pop filter and everything already built in and it is really hard to overload that thing. I've recorded uh, screaming vocals and growly stuff with it um, many times. You can just go straight in with no problem and you don't get a lot of room noise and it's really hard to make the thing sound bad. So that's a good one. It's about 300 bucks, brand new, can't go wrong. The amount of VST plugin amp sims that are out there is starting to get absurd and many of them sound amazing. So if you're recording at home, you don't need something like an Axe FX or a Kemper to get really great tones. I have an Axe FX, I love it a lot. It was like $2,200 all in. So it's, um, you know, it's not something that you're gonna wanna invest in right away. 
uh, spend a lot of time with some free VSTs like uh, Poolin plugins, X50, which might be, I think it's pretty cheap, might not be free. Um, uh, Amplitube is really good, Easy Mix. And if you're just making demos, you don't, you don't need to get anything else, just about, you know? Get a, I would get Easy Drummer, some kind of either Easy Mix or free AmpSim plugin, and you are good to go. You will make, you'll make demos until the cows come home and they'll sound better than albums that came out in the 80s, no joke. All right guys, thank you so much for tuning in yet again. Uh, please continue to ask questions and I will continue to answer them as often as possible. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already because otherwise you might forget. You might ask me a question and then you'll never hear the answer because you won't get, the, get a notification that the next video goes up. So don't miss it. I'll see you then. The actual mix, it's not specific. The fuck was that? Okay, because of the mix. Uh, it depends, oh, it's the fucking, my Xbox is freaking out right now. What the shit? What the fuck? Somebody's digging around. What the fuck? Okay, well. Speakers going this way and that way. What the fuck? Fuck, lost my train of thought. <clears throat> now this could possibly verily <laughs> still have things you want to ask me. Uh, continue to ask, you know, and criticize me to my face, you fucking dicks. These answers are going to contain mostly my opinions. So if you don't like them, fuck off. Ha! You asked. Don't ask for my opinion and then call me a dick when I give you my opinion. Because that's what opinions are for. For people criticizing them. The Google Flugenheim. Nope. The Google Flugen... Nope. The Google... Wow, this one's actually difficult. The Google Flugelheim. <laughs> the Google Flugelhorn is at the Guggenheim. It actually helps if you imagine the things that you're talking about as you're saying it. Otherwise, it just turns into gibberish. But if I think about the Google logo and then a trumpet thing and the museum, then it works. Amazing.